Hello, I'm going to talk about quantum amplifiers for a neutrino mass measurement. The second part of my talk is going to go to explain the research and development effort to design quantum amplifiers tailored to the detection of microwaves. But first, I'm going to try to convince you that these low noise devices are the key to determining the neutrino mass. So this is the current status of the neutrino mass measurement. And we have a direct method which relies on the distribution of the neutrino and electron kinetic energies in beta decay processes. Later more about this, but currently the leading experiment is Katrin, a German experiment of a very big size, as you can see on the left, which has a limit of around one electron volt and will go a bit further down in the coming years. There are also a set of indirect methods. One of them is the so-called neutrino-less double beta decay, which has never been observed yet. And then there is also cosmology. And there we try through the signatures of growth and evolution of galaxy clusters in the cosmic microwave background to put the limit to the mass that these neutrinos can have. The important thing here is that these indirect methods will always be model dependent and this is really stressing that we also need a direct method to unambiguously define the neutrino mass. So a bit more about this direct method. So on the bottom left you have a tritium atom which beta decays into a helium nucleus and an electron and a neutrino. We are not able to measure all these neutrinos, so we are focusing on the electron and we measure the kinetic energy of the electron to build up a distribution as shown in the top left. If we understand this uh, distribution very well, we can infer information about the neutrino mass because the total energy in this decay is fixed at something like 18,500 electron volts. If we now zoom in to the tail, then we can see that the end of the tail in the bottom right plot slightly depends on the mass of the neutrino. And that's why this tail is so important. You can see the effect is of the order of one electron volt, so way smaller than the whole distribution. So project eight, the collaboration that I am a member of, tries to do this measurement in a different way while keeping the size fairly small and increasing the sensitivity. One point here is to use the source inside the detector. So use tritium gas and atomic tritium inside your detector volume. And the second one is to actually this electron which you want to measure to catch this in a magnetic field. In this magnetic field, it will perform cyclotron radiation motion. So it will emit microwave radiation, which can be measured. The formula on the bottom right shows that the energy of the electron is linked to this frequency. So project 8 employs this process called cyclotron radiation emission spectroscopy to find out what the neutrino mass is. And we will refer to this to CRES from now on. So this is a huge undertaking, which means that it comes in different phases. Phase one was to demonstrate the detection of cyclotron radiation from a single electron. Such an event is shown on the bottom right here. So you have the time axis on the bottom and the y axis is a frequency measurement. So close to time zero, an electron uh, tritium atom decays, gives you an electron, and this electron radiates energy, therefore losing energy, the frequency goes up um, through this energy loss. And we see also these jumps, and this is actually when your electron is scattering with the gas that is in your apparatus. In the second uh, phase of the experiment, which is almost completed, we used tritium as a source gas for the first time, and we're therefore able to put a neutrino mass limit, albeit not competitive yet. In phase three, we are having two current R&D efforts that want to improve these results. One is going to free space so that we can actually scale this effort. And this comes with a lot of difficulties, such as our motion will not be just circular anymore, but more complicated. And secondly, we are also exploring atomic tritium as a source, because for atomic tritium compared to molecular tritium, we understand the connection between these electrons and the neutrino mass even better, leading to a higher sensitivity. Then in phase four, we hope to put all of these together 
to really go to an ultimate unambiguous determination of the electron neutrino mass. So I talked a bit about challenges of scaling up this experiment. So here I'm trying to guide you through this. So we are trying to measure the tail of this electron contra kinetic energy, and we want to do this with high statistics. On the same time, our electrons will scatter, and we are also restricted in how dense our source gas can be because we need to trap it, um, and there are restrictions on this. So this restricts the density that we can use. So we will need a very high trigger efficiency and a large volume to acquire these high statistics. A second point now is that the power of such an electron emitted in a constant magnetic field is constant. So your signal power is constant. But if we want to scale up and we go to this free space multi-antenna readout, we will have a lower coverage and also a lower received power per channel. Therefore, if we want to keep our signal to noise power ratio anywhere detectable, we will really need to be able to minimize the noise power. And this is exactly where these quantum amplifiers come in. So let me first sketch the field a little bit. So these quantum amplifiers are really driven by quantum computing because quantum computers consist of superconducting qubits and their signals are very weak microwaves. Often the first stage amplification of these microwaves limits the performance. The amplifier bandwidth, on the other hand, is very important because this enables the multiplexing of multiple qubits in your quantum processor. And here, there are a lot of similarities with what Project 8 is aiming to achieve. So Project 8 looks at synchrotron emission, which is also in this microwave region. And the trigger efficiency ultimately depends on the noise performance of the first stage amplifier. We are also interested in the bandwidth because we might want to multiplex different antenna channels and some calibration sources might require also a large bandwidth. So what are these quantum amplifiers exactly? They are based on a principle that is called parametric amplification. And there is a classical analog for this. And this is the swing which is given on the left top here. So if you want to make the swing go around, you can move your center of mass of your body in a given frequency with a phase offset compared to the swinging motion. And what you are effectively doing is transferring power from your motion to the swing motion. Parametric amplification does the same. You have a signal wave and you are now going to mix this with a way stronger pump wave and you are ex exchanging energy to, ex uh, to amplify this signal wave. Of course, here there are still two laws that we need to respect, energy conservation and momentum conservation. Energy conservation is sketched on the left and basically means that your pump photons will split up in a signal photon and an idler photon. The signal photon will amplify your signal. The second one is momentum conservation, also referred to as phase matching. And this will effectively put a restriction to which um, frequency space is gonna be amplified. So it defines the bandwidth of your amplifier. The first models here and the simplest forms came up a decennia ago and were single cell Josephson parametric amplifiers. So the single cell is here given in blue. These were circular devices, so you come in with a signal, then in a device called the directional coupler, you mix this in with a pump, then you have a circulator feeding those into your amplifier and reflecting those back to your output. These devices typically had a small bandwidth of the order of 100 megahertz, and they have a uh, demonstrated central frequencies all over the place from 600 megahertz up to 7 gigahertz. Due to this combination of um, Josephson junctions in a squid loop, they are very sensitive to magnetic fields. Recently, in 2015, the idea was to um, extend this idea into a transmission line, um, which consists about lot of a lot of these cells. So the device um, shown in the picture here has 2,000 of these cells, each containing Josephson junctions, 
And additionally, there are also face matching elements inserted here, given in green and orange. And these aim to um, make the face relation, so the momentum conservation valid for an as wide as possible range of frequency. So effectively, we are enhancing the amplifier bandwidth to the order of gigahertz, it's more than an order larger than these previous basic um, Josephson parametric amplifiers. I also want to thank here Lincoln Laboratories, which is um, part of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which actually fabricates these devices and tailors them to our needs. So now I told these quantum amplifiers are out there, are they actually worth using? So for this, we have this plot. Uh, the blue line over here shows in function of a frequency on the X axis, what the noise temperature is on the Y axis for a single photon. So that's your single photon resolution. And it's kind of our aim where we want to go at. Then in orange, we see commercial available um, solid state amplifiers, state of the art and expensive, but off the shelf available. And these are approximately one order of magnitude above this limit. And then the green crosses show what is actually have been demonstrated by quantum amplifiers, which is way closer to this limit, which explains our interest. You also see two lines vertical on this plot, and this is where phase two of project eight was located and where MIT is currently trying to develop a quantum amplifier, which has not been demonstrated before at those frequencies. So let's go now to the lab that we have at MIT, and this is kind of the minimal setup that we use to characterize and test these devices. So in the schematic on the right, you have a frequency generator in green on the top left and a network analyzer too. And those two will be feed into an input line, goes through our Chupa amplifier. Then we go through three isolators to protect it from noise from higher uh, temperature stages. We have a, a hemmed uh, semiconductor amplifier. Then we have a room temperature amplifier and we read these signals out by a spectrum analyzer and a network analyzer. The first thing we now want to know is what is the gain of these devices? Therefore, we use our network analyzer in transmission mode and we scan how this varies in function of the pump parameters. So I told you this quantum amplifier that we call Chupa needs to be fed with a pump that we mix with our signal, but depending on our pump uh, parameters, our performance will change. So here we see that for a specific set of parameters, we can obtain up to 25 uh, decibel of gain, which is amazing but you don't get this for free. There will also be a noise increase. And this we measure with the spectrum analyzer. So we can now look at the same two dimensional grid of pump settings, pump power and pump frequency, what the noise increases. The blue box here shows where we found the optimal gain of a bit above 25 um, decibel. We see that that's definitely not the lowest noise increase. So it's not our optimal. So now to find a quantitative indicator to optimize these pump settings, we're going to look at the signal to noise ratio improvement. This is the subtraction of the gain and the noise increase. Now we see that the blue box is definitely not anymore the optimal. The optimal is in the small island over here. But I will argue that because this is such an isolated space that actually for stability reasons, it's smarter to big pump settings where the green box is located and still have very good gain and signal improvement. And this is what I show on these two plots. So I'm going to guide you through them. Let's focus on the first row. That is the noise increase as measured with spectrum analyzer. Then the bottom row is the gain as, me as measured with the network analyzer. Both plots have an orange line, which is the baseline when our quantum amplifier is turned off. Then we have the blue line, which we see in the bottom, has the highest gain. But as we look at the top, it also has a very high noise increase that is very, has a lot of spurious spikes in there. So if we now look at the green line, which is the optimal settings for stability reasons, we see that our gain is a bit lower, although we still have a gain of more than 20 decibel in a range of 3 gigahertz we actually have a way lower noise increase. So we have, we gain stability and we have a signal to noise ratio improvement of 15 decibel over a very large bandwidth. So 
with this result, I would like to take you to my conclusions. And this is, I introduced to you project eight, which aims to be the ultimate neutrino mass experiment. And it will do so by measuring the electron kinetic energy from tritium beta decays and infer the neutrino mass. In practice, this is actually a high precision cryogenic microwave frequency experiment. And this is exactly how it's linked to this development of Josephson based parametric amplifiers, which currently have been developed for qubit readout in quantum computers. And these enable quantum limited noise temperatures for microwave signals, which give project eight this chance to measure the neutrino mass. Currently, we are um, adapting this amplifier and packaging design to access an even wider range of frequencies. And we are characterizing the performance of these devices in magnetic fields and coupled to antennas to tailor them for the needs in Project 8. So with this, I would like to acknowledge all my collaborators, acknowledge institutes at MIT and Lincoln Laboratory, and open the floor for questions right now, but also through my email address, which is listed on this slide.